Welcome everybody uh, to the course on Earth Station and Earth Terminal Design for Satellite Communications. And this is a comprehensive course of uh, the engineering aspects of developing really the entire ground segment and then in depth into the Earth Station, which is the large type of facility used as a hub or a video uplink and a terminal. Uh, and the most common type of terminal is the very small aperture terminal or VSAT. Uh, which can be fixed or it could be mobile uh, on different platforms. So we'll go into uh, technical aspects of that approach for providing communications. Uh, some background on me. Um, I had my own satellite communications consulting firm concentrating on technology and business aspects of the industry. And I've been at this for a total of 50 years uh, in the industry, but the last 20 I've been a consultant with my own practice called Application Technology Strategy. And here is contact information uh, for you to reach me uh, if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, don't hesitate to use the email. Um, I'm a graduate engineer in uh, electronics engineering and communications engineering, uh, bachelor's degree from City University of New York and master's degree uh, from University of Maryland in College Park, where I also studied uh, computer engineering as well as communications engineering. Um, I was in the U.S. Army for four years in the Signal Corps. Um, before I went into industry, I uh, started out with the Communications Satellite Corporation uh, in 1969. Uh, three years there, and then Hughes Aircraft Company for 25. That's the company that developed the geostationary satellite concept. Um, and following retirement in 1999, I became a consultant. So that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Uh, I was also an adjunct uh, professor with the University of Wisconsin uh, for a 10-year period. I retired from that program uh, so I could concentrate on the consulting activities, which uh, have gone intensively for the last 20 years. So one of the things I do in my practice is this training. Um, and in fact, I developed this course and a book on this subject, which came out um, before I, I retired, uh, so over 20 years ago, and there's a second edition of that book. So I write books as well, uh, training, but also consulting to organizations uh, that develop satellite communications, space and ground, and also that use the, uh, those resources to provide uh, strategic advantage, uh, business or uh, mission advantages. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the, those, uh, those solutions are used by both the private sector and the government. So the approach uh, to the course is that it's going to be at the system and the subsystem level, and we'll take it down to components in many cases when those components are particularly critical uh, to meeting the objectives. Uh, it's a blend of theory and practice. Uh, we need to do that so that we cover the solid foundation of physics, uh, and uh, other other areas in telecommunications um, and aerospace, et cetera, uh, as they tie back, electromagnetics, of course, as they tie back uh, to the solutions that we put in. So we'll get into the practice, the use of technologies that is real world technologies, even though it's based on theory, we'll get into the practice. And I say lots of nuts and bolts. Um, I know from uh, past experience that you wanna know about the details, so we'll get into budgets, we'll get into types of components and the performance we need from them. Uh, to the extent we'd like to share information and experience, so feel free to uh, comment um, in the chat. And if you have a question at any time, please ask it. So this is the outline of the course. It's in three days. It's a very intensive course. Uh, the first day is just crammed of information on the foundations of SATCOM. I need to do this so that we all look at it the same way and uh, we have a common language. Now this uh, terminology that I, that I use is the industry standard ter terminology, uh, which I pretty much grew up with. It has evolved to a, a certain extent. Some terms have come up that uh, are relatively new in the last, let's say, 10 to 15 years. So I'll make sure that I do acquaint you with what the, the new ways of, of referring to things to uh, would be, but the foundations doesn't change. That is the physical principles underlying this. Uh, the networking principles are very important. Uh, we'll get into those later, especially the internet protocol and putting that up over satellite. 
So day one is uh, fundamentals. Day two gets into engineering of a major earth station, a uh, large facility. I'll show you a picture of one in a moment. And uh, then we'll get into the budgets, which is a key part of laying out a ground segment in, in, and the ground segment facility, such as a teleport, such as a VSAT net, uh, terminal, uh, so we can understand how these come together and how we budget performance um, throughout. And then the use of the link budget to assess overall performance, uh, we'll spend some time on that. On uh, day three, we'll get into uh, very important related topics like earth terminal maintenance and procedures and uh, getting satellite services up on the air. Um, and then in particular, looking at VSAT networks uh, because they really are a big part of our industry vis-a-vis -vis, uh, two-way broadband communications, which is pretty much the main application that I'm con considering here. Uh, satellite broadcasting is built into this as well, um, but really the the newer uses and the, the future of this industry is tied more to two-way internet active services to fixed and mobile platforms. So talking about the satellite uh, evolution, when I started in the industry, uh, we only had a few of these very small geostationary satellites like Intelsat 1 and 2 and 3 when I started with CompSat. CompSat put the Intelsat system together. Intelsat is still today the largest operator of geostationary satellites. Uh, we went from little satellites to these kind of medium size that could provide a lot of television channels and opened up cable TV uh, as a market in the 1970s. And that grew by leaps and bounds in the 1980s and 90s, uh, including going to direct to home television. Um, after 2000, uh, there was a demand for more bandwidth, but there are not more orbit positions to utilize. So uh, the industry figured out how to cram more capacity onto a given satellite, and that was through the use of multiple spot beams. And so here we see a picture of Indelsat Epic, uh, which was launched uh, around 2017, I think, at this point. And it's a series of what are called high throughput satellites, or HTS. Uh, so a lot of capacity is appearing in the HTS uh, domain, uh, multiple spot beams, uh, very much uh, targeted at uh, broadband two-way interactive communications. These are very la large platforms, uh, power levels up to 20 kilowatts. So let's look at the ground station evolution. <clears throat> at the same time, when we started out in the late 60s <clears throat> with those small satellites, you had to have big dishes on the ground, big antennas, 30 meter size, like this one in Edom, West Virginia. Now, why did I pick this one? That's the first ground station I ever visited. That was uh, roughly 1971, um, <clears throat> living in uh, the Maryland, uh, Washington, D.C. area, um, and uh, we took a vacation out in West Virginia, and I wanted to take a look at Edom. So we went out there, uh, this facility being operated by CompSat with these very large antennas, but over time, satellites got more powerful, antennas got smaller, so we got to the nine meter class, um, roughly 1975. And then finally, um, late 1990s, 2000s, we got to the VSATs with very small dishes. These are fixed antennas. And now we're looking at phased array antennas, which um, don't mechanically point at the satellite, but lay flat and electrically point at the satellite. There's a lot of interest in electronic phased array. Uh, types of antennas. Uh, we'll touch on that later. Uh, along the line of um, fixed antennas, we have these transportable uh, terminals, which can be taken out in the field and opened up, set up, and then will point on their own towards a satellite and acquire and transmit, uh, completing the link. And these are two examples. Of, of this type of portable antennas. The one on the left happens to be at KU band and the one on the right at KA band. Uh, we'll talk about the frequency bands and the issues related to the different bands. Uh, but clearly, if you want broadband communications to a relatively small aperture, such as these around one meter, uh, you're going to be using KU and KU band, KA band, which are the frequencies above 10 gigahertz. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of communications on the move, uh, also important in uh, uh, the growing aspects of, of using geostationary satellites, we have this type that is mounted on a vehicle, 
or believe it or not, that reflector can stay on the satellite as the vehicle goes across any kind of terrain. Um, another type is a flat panel, which is oriented towards the satellite like, like a parabolic dish, but has no feed because the feed is behind it, and it has hundreds of thousands of little elements to cr create a beam that's broadside. But it, so it has to be mechanically steered. So why would you use this? Well, it has a lower profile than the one with the dish, perhaps, or some other advantage uh, of that nature. But if you really want to go flat, then you need to use a phased array. Um, this is uh, a mechanically um, steered phased array, but it is a phased array. That is, the beam can go off in any angle. Uh, even as the aircraft flies, uh, whatever uh, path and whatever uh, orientation that it has to. Uh, there are also handheld and portable terminals. Now, these are not broadband terminals. These are uh, up to medium data, data rate, up to 500 kilobit per second type of terminals uh, used with uh, mobile satellites. Uh, we're really not going to get into those, the design of those systems. It's uh, a very different environment and very different type of operation, but I mentioned it in passing. Now here's a teleport. What is a teleport? Well, a teleport is a piece of land which has been developed into an earth station that typically has a lot of antennas, uh, like this one that you see here. I believe this one is in Maryland. And uh, it has uh, dozens uh, of dishes. Um, and it has a building with a lot of equipment in it. Uh, here's an example of a teleport that happens to have two dishes up against the, the building and the most, most of the electronics are inside the building. So teleports could have one or two antennas or they could have dozens of antennas. It's just a major facility. And one of these antennas is establishing links probably back to VSATs of the type that I just showed you. So we have a star type of network, that being the most uh, common. And through satellite communications, we can implement uh, a number of different connectivities, as I call it. Point to point is the classical communication link, point A or Earth Station A communicating with Earth Station B through a satellite repeater. Uh, we're going to concentrate on geostationary because that is the most common type of system today. Uh, we could look at uh, other orbits besides geostationary. Um, and in fact, uh, many of these uh, systems will work with non-geostationary systems as well. Uh, and we see that to connect A to B, there have to be two paths, A to B and B back to A to connect, uh, to complete a two-way duplex link. And that communication can either be pre-assigned, that is, we set this up ahead of time on a schedule and we'll leave it up and working, or it could be demand assigned, DA, set up on demand like a telephone connection or a video conference. Uh, both mechanisms are possible, but the question is, is the equipment present at these two terminals to do that? The satellite is just acting as a repeater. It'll, it'll receive and then retransmit whatever it gets. Uh, in this particular case, it's gonna retransmit and send in the same beam. So if I was to, um, try and draw that for you and say, here's the beam. I can see where my dot is. Okay, there's the line. Okay, the beam on the ground that the satellite produces might look like that. And so A, station A is transmitting, excuse me one second. Station A is transmitting to B and this satellite establishes a beam that covers A and B, both of them. So actually B, a station A can receive its own signal. And station B likewise receive its own signal. On the other hand, if I can erase this, okay. In the other case, we'll, we'll draw ourselves two beams, one beam, on station A and the other beam only on station B, different beam. Okay, so now in this case, A is transmitting up through the satellite and is only received at B, not at A, and B transmits through the satellite and is only received at A. Uh, why would we do it this way? Well, it turns out we would have twice the available bandwidth because there are two beams. 
we would double the capacity. This is inherently why we use high throughput satellites. Now, another very important connectivity is point to multipoint, which we could also call broadcast, where we're transmitting from an uplink earth station, like at a teleport, through the satellite, and it happens to be received across a beam, like I showed you before, where there are many receiving points. We call these remote receive onlys. Okay, so these are like your satellite TV dishes. Uh, many of you have, I happen to have one. Uh, the broadcast is done, in the case of my system, from out west, um, uh, where it's a lot drier and not affected as much by rain, and then I'm received, I'm one of these dishes here in the Austin, Texas area. This has led to a very large industry and usage of uh, 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 geostationary satellites for satellite TV. Most of the revenue for satellite operators is still from this type of service. However, there are competing ways to do satellite distribu uh, television distribution, as you well know. I, for one, more than half of my viewing is with streaming over the internet. We still use satellite TV for the real-time programming, but anytime we're watching movies or TV series, it's usually um, uh, often, uh, not usually often, uh, through streaming. So satellites need to adapt to that, and they do through the HTS type of system where we go from teleport to, to user one at a time. Here we're going to the same signal to everybody. Now we can still make this interactive and we still do uh, for uh, multi-point to point or interactive. So we have the broadcast as before and all these dishes are receiving the same signal, but they individually can transmit back packets of data. Now we call these bursts instead of packets because they are a period of time on the air and then the rest of the time nothing all right and we need to do it that way because those signals are on the same frequency and if they arrive at the satellite at the same time they'll jam each other so they are spaced out according to a time plan a synchronization plan so that when they're repeated they end up going back to the teleport or the hub station as we more likely call it um, in a non-interfering non-overlapping man manner so that's called time division multiple access of TDMA. I'm sure you're you're all familiar with that. And there's another technique called FDMA, uh, frequency division multiple access, where stations don't transmit uh, can transmit at the same time, but they're on different frequencies, which are indicated by these colors. So as they go through the satellite, they don't interfere with each other, and they can be received at station A or Earth station A without a problem. And this works well if you have a lot of bulk data that you're sending and you need to be sending it continuously. Uh, the two methods can actually achieve the same result. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, experience and the type of equipment you have that more often def defines or determines the multiple access. Now there's another multiple access mentioned here, CDMA, code division multiple access. And in that case, these signals are on the same frequency and they would jam each other. So how do we prevent that? Well, we prevent that by scrambling them with a code, uh, and each one, for example, could be a different code, so that even though they're on top of each other, the de-spreading done at Earth Station A separates one signal from the ones that are potentially interfering. So we'll talk more about that later. Uh, it's not that popular on geostationary satellites, but it does have a role to play, especially with mobile uh, terminals. And um, at this point, I want to quickly review the elements of an Earth station, since that's the focus of the course. Um, we have here the block diagram of typically a, a larger Earth station, such as used for a hub. The Earth station A on the left that I showed, uh, this one's a transmit and receive, of course, so we can receive the remote sites transmitting. So we have an antenna. We'll always have an antenna, fairly large, usually more than three meters in diameter and it will receive signals through these low noise amplifiers, uh, pass them to down converters where they're translating from the radio frequency, the RF, which might be KU band, for example, down to an intermediate frequency and into the demodulator section of a modem. That will get us back to data. That data gets processed, demultiplexed, uh, and passed on through a terrestrial interface to end users. The users, as their data is, is 
uh, introduced. That data goes through the modulator section, um, comes out at intermediate frequency into an up converter to translate to RF frequency and into a high power amplifier, thence to the same antenna uh, through a device uh, called a diplexer or duplexer, depending upon uh, the style of microwave components in here, and sends out the signal at the same time the, the antenna is receiving. So how do we keep those separate? Well, they're in two different frequency bands, the uplink frequency band, space to earth, and the downlink frequency band, I'm sorry, that's uplink is earth to space and the downlink is space to earth. Those frequency bands are predefined uh, by international regulation and in turn the satellite is constructed to follow those, those definitions of the uplink band and the downlink band. So this is the communications part of the terminal. We have the RF terminal and we have the baseband equipment and we have the terrestrial interface. But there are more things needed that we'll talk about, what I call support systems here. You'll need commercial power, you need an uninterruptible power source, or UPS or power system, potentially using generators to supply power when the commercial is interrupted, uh, grounding to protect uh, equipment, people, uh, and especially to deal with lightning in certain parts of the world, uh, telecommunications if this is a major facility and people in there need, their, need access to telephone lines, and then utilities um, other than uh, power, but water and gas and what have you. Uh, then we have a, a we need to uh, maintain uh, the um, the uh, environment inside this terminal to protect equipment. So we have heating, ventilating, and air conditioning HVAC systems, and a monitoring control system uh, so that uh, operators will know the status of the equipment, can control configuration. And we'll take a look at those systems as well. Those are very important in the operations of SATCOM because everything is so far apart. So that's a basic uh, configuration of an earth station. And actually, the RF terminal and baseband applies to every kind of earth station, including VSATs and even handheld terminals. But as the station gets larger, you bring in the support system. So we'll be talking about that. Now, as a concrete example, uh, here is a teleport that happens to be in Hawaii. Here we see two antennas. Uh, this block diagram corresponds to the configuration of one of those antennas, which happens to be a C-band antenna. That is, it uplinks at six gigahertz and downlinks at four gigahertz. Here's that device that separates transmit from receive. And so we have um, uplink section and downlink section in this diagram. This you could compare with the previous one, which is a very generic one. This is an actual uh, hardware block diagram. And down in the lower right is the indoor equipment, which is primarily the electronics that you see here inside one of these shelters. So there you have it. I mean, this is the actual earth station facility um, designed and constructed in a way to meet the communication requirements.